I'm chuckling because we're on YouTube Live, so I got to be somewhat professional, right? At least I have to look that way. So I'm going to suck in my stomach and look kind of studious here, but how scary is that, right? <laughs> I got the thumbs up. Well, thank you uh, for coming in today in your busy schedule. Uh, my goal uh, tonight is for you to live, leave here somewhat differently. Now, I got good news and bad news. I'll give you the bad news first. This seminar that I penned a year ago uh, was designed or written uh, for a whole day. So what's going to happen is in the little short time that we have, I'm going to try to compress it and just give you the main facts. So my suggestion would be is that right now you need to have your mental track shoes on because we're going to go through stuff fairly quickly. Now, in your notes, you'll see a three by five card, and uh, that's for questions. So we'll go for a stretch, and when I think we all need a bit of a break, when you get tired of listening to me, we'll take a break. But if you have any questions, jot them down on the three by five card. Now, what happens with Q&A, and I always have people come up and say, you know, we just really enjoyed the question and answer time. Uh, what happens sometimes, and I, I fall into the same bracket, is that very often questions turn into stories. And that's great. You know, I certainly want to hear what's going on in people's lives. Uh, but it tends to eat some of our time up. So my newest invention or thought is to just jot your questions down uh, right prior to break or during break, and then uh, we'll entertain some of those. Does that sound like a plan? Okay. I want to begin uh, by saying that uh, I am not a motivational speaker. I am not a uh, biblical scholar. I am a student of God's Word, but I, I don't consider myself a scholar. The other thing you're going to notice is that I'm going to bring a lot of science into our talk tonight. Now, I'm not here to promote science. I'm a student of behavioral science. And one of the things I've learned in the last seven years, and I'm very excited about, is that as you really begin to look at uh, data and findings, and I'm a data and findings geek, what you find out is that science, instead of being at odds with the Bible, uh, for the last couple of years is starting to walk in close cadence with what the Bible has said for years. How exciting is that, right? So for the folks on YouTube, uh, my buddy's up in Fort Drum. Uh, any soldier right now, our ministry is giving away three free fishing trips uh, for the month of uh, May and June. Uh, so if you are a vet uh, and you've been injured, uh, we have a free fishing trip. Last week, one of the vets uh, won a fishing tournament. He uh, caught a 15-pound walleye. How cool is that? And he was just really excited. So uh, come visit us and, uh, you know, leave your contact information. Uh, the other thing I want to share with you tonight is that I'd really like you to be part of our ministry uh, every week. Um, I sit down and I pen some articles that deal with family life and being a Christian in this crazy world of ours. A lot of psychology and therapy stuff. Uh, and the uh, website to go to is TBS. It's just simply Tom Bacciani, B-A-S-C-I-A-N-I, B-A-S-C-I-A-N-I, seminars.com. And I could share that. Uh, during break. The other one you can find us at christianspeaker.net is another one. Uh, for the next 11 months, we're going to have a seminar right here in Pulaski. Uh, I got one down in Syracuse next month as well. But this year, um, all the seminars are going to focus around growth, the road ahead. So I said earlier, uh, shameful admittance, that I am not a motivational speaker. Uh, I consider myself, and I think I have it right after 48 years, but I consider myself a change person. 
So I sit down with folks and I uh, kind of walk alongside them in regard to where their life is and where they want to go. And what I found out, I've been retired now for the last 12 years, is what I found out is that as Christians, we have a lot of stuff in common. We shared a lot of the same challenges. We shared a lot of the same burdens. And the very good news is that we save a God that is redemptive. That's one of those $5 Christianese words that mean God is in the business of grabbing us by the hand and helping us get to a place where we need to be. How cool is that, right? So uh, tonight we're going to be talking about uh, habits and routines. Now let me give you the game plan. I, I said earlier that when I penned this last year, it really was a study that would take up for the most part a whole day. But what we're going to look at tonight is I want to look at specifically why habits that you and ha I have in our lives are so powerful. And the second one is uh, what habits need to go. And the third one is uh, are there some habits you never knew you needed? Now, they not, might not necessarily be in that order, but our first session, before break, uh, for the most part, is going to encompass that. And then when we come back after break, uh, we're going to look at your personality and my personality. Your personality and my personality, for the most part, can be rendered down to the three very key items. Number one, what we think about, how we feel, and how we act. As you sit here tonight, it's the mixture of all three items. And for us to move forward in regard to change, um, we, have to, we have to look at very specifically and very candidly in regard to the thoughts uh, that we entertain. Because as we think, it becomes how we feel, and of course how we now, if we don't do anything, let's say in the next week or two, to kind of bring a change for the future, what's going to happen is we're going to end up living a life that we had the last five years. And that may be fine, but if you have any inclination at all that you want to move forward and you want to be uh, used by God in a powerful way, then we have to put some things in place. And, and one of the things that tends to be very beneficial are habits and routines. Now, we know habits can be negative as well, right? I mean, we all, over a lifespan, have had habits that just simply have to go. A good habit would be uh, when you get in a car, you click your seatbelt. And if you don't do that, there's a nice gentleman or lady that, with these real pretty lights on the top of the roof, will stop you and remind you of the necessity to do just that. So if you're anything like me, if we're vulnerable, and we're very candid in regard to where we are, where we are in life. Um, we got to take a close look at the habits that we have in place. Now, I would love for you to take notes. I'll tell you what the stats are. You're going to probably get tired of me saying this in, for the next hour and a half, but 45% uh, of what you will do tomorrow is going to be habit driven. Alarm's going to go off, or you're going to get up on your own. You're going to get up on the same side of the bed. You're going to go to the bathroom if you're like me. You're going to go to the kitchen, grab your favorite mug. You're going to go to the coffee pot or the microwave and put your teacup in or your coffee cup and just follow this whole habit driven procedure that we follow. So what happens day after day after day as we begin to repeat those same actions, we fall into what we call the, the habit loop. I'm going to talk very specifically, scientifically, in just a few minutes in regard to how that works. Now, like I said, we can have good habits, and of course, we can have bad habits. The things we got going for ourselves is that we have uh, the Word of God, right? Just that powerful word of God that's able to reach into our hearts and do this surgical work. And then the other thing is we have uh, the power of prayer. Um, the issue with the power of prayer is 
uh, you do not receive because you do not ask, right? So the issue we have with is the asking part. I think that's where many times we stumble. So the expectation is certainly on God's part is that we need to be in the business of asking God to help us take our life and get it to a place where it needs to be. That's the very exciting thing. All right, so let's, let's kind of move on. So habits, 45% of what you're going to do tomorrow is habit-driven. Now, if you got a pen, it'd be great to write the notes, then I'll tell you why. Proven fact that if you just hear something auditorily, at best, you're going to be able to retain about 14 to 18% at best. Once you write it down, the odds go up dramatically, exponentially. Actually, uh, somewhere about 92 to 94%. I remember in college, we used to talk about um, doing an all-nighter for study, and... Uh, what you find out about that is that's a terrible decision to make. If you stay up all night and expect to just uh, sponge up all these facts that you've missed for the whole semester, it's not going to work. Your ability to retain facts and information will drop 45% in an all-nighter because sleep is a very important proponent of this whole thing we call life. Now, in 2018, the very exciting thing is that there's been a, a tremendous amount of studies in regard to sleep deprivation. What they're finding out is that if we uh, fall short in regard to our sleeping habits, uh, it's going to vastly affect uh, not only our spiritual realm, but our physical realm as well. What they're finding out is that uh, there, ten there seems to be a tie uh, between cancer and poor sleep habits. So what happens is as we get older in life, uh, the, stu the studies go on to say, as we get older in life, our sleep habits go somewhat awry. So instead of getting 6.5 to 7.5 average of sleep hours a night, uh, very often they're cut back dramatically. And that affects how we feel and that affects how we think. So, so consequently, when we talk about habits, one of the must-dos in regard to sleep deprivation is that we got to get in the habit of sleeping well, sleeping better. Okay, let's go forward. Now, I, take, I want to take some time and just thank uh, some people, some authors, and some of the think tanks, uh, universities that have spent hours and, and hours in regard to data and studies. I'd like to thank John Hopkins Hospital Department of Psychiatry uh, Harvard University Research Department, Stanford, uh, Dr. Daniel Amen on mental health, and the list goes on and on. But these are all folks that have had some input in regard to our study tonight. Okay, change. Whose job is it? <laughs> I see something going like this. We don't, as people, I can tell you that we don't do change real well. I mean, we want to change, and very often we have great intentions to do so. But we're going to kind of take a look at some of the barriers that you and I kind of come across when we want to bring change in our life. So we take this thing called the Bible, and we read it, and God expecta God's expectation for us is that we read God's word, we look at our life, and then we make a course change. Uh, one of my favorite scriptures in the Bible is Psalm 119 verse 53 that says, I thought about my ways and I turned my feet. So the expectation there is, there is that God expects us to think. That's kind of rare this today, isn't it? I mean, we live in a society that is just so fast-paced. We very seldom are intentional about taking time to just sit down and think. Um, in a few minutes, we'll talk about when's the best time to do that. You know, when you, when's the best time where you're going to get the most out of your devotionals? You know, is it, is it the morning? Is it mid-afternoon? Is it at night? Uh, does the environment have to do anything to do with that at all? So those are all things that we're going to kind of look at to sharpen our skills to change. The very first step in change is how we think.
the two most powerful words that can ever come out of your mouth is, I am, and then you fill in the blank. See, we have to get to a place where we don't see our lives where they are right now, but we see our lives where they're going to be. And that's the secret of growth. The secret of growth is stretching. The secret of growth is stretching. Now, when we, when we talk about the subject uh, in regard to thinking, the very next step is that whole idea about having the ability to make a choice, right? So, so of all the creatures that God created on this earth, we're the only creatures that have been given the gift of choice. But God says, you can choose, but I fully expect you to choose wisely. Now, unlike that Canadian goose up there, animals, for the most part, move to and fro by instincts. Linda and I have been in Florida. We've been blessed for the last month. And we saw a lot of Canadian geese down there. You know, if I walked up to one of them and said, you know, guys, the weather up in New York has just been terrible. Why don't you guys just kind of hang out here for a while or maybe even go fly to Colorado for a time because this whole New York trip, man, isn't going to make it. They're going to go, whoa, who is this weirdo, right? So they, uh, for the most part, move to and fro by instincts. In regard to us, we have been given the gift of choice. So every choice has a destination. Or another way to put it is direction determines destination. If you were in my seminar last month, I said, you know, if I uh, inherited a tremendous amount of money, I said, and said, look, I'm gonna, I rented a Greyhound, and we're going to go to Florida. And I, I send Linda to Rite Aid, and I say, buy all the uh, uh, lotions and, and beach towels that you can buy. And I want everyone uh, in the parking lot at McDonald's at uh, 8 o'clock next Saturday, and I'm taking you all to, I'm taking you all to Florida. It's not going to cost you a dime. So we all pile on the bus. And I tell the driver, OK, head for Florida. So he starts to pull out. But instead of taking the exit south, he takes the exit north. And we end up in Quebec that night. So the moral of the story is direction determines destination. Now, I always like to equate that, too, when I'm talking to folks, is that uh, the Bible has much to say about sowing and reaping. So if I was to equate um, choices that you make and I make, it's a lot like a farmer who walks up to his field, and he's, of course, got two hands. And in one hand, he's got good seed. and the other hand, he's got poor seed. Now, the ground really doesn't care what the farmer plants. But the promissory note from the ground is that, or the land is that, these seeds will grow and prosper and, and mature up to be harvested. So the farmer goes to the field and he digs a little hole and plants the good seed. And right next to it, he digs a little hole and plants the bad seed. And that's the same scenario with our choices. Because on any given day, we're given the choice to think and feel and act correctly or not. And our uh, navigation system purely should rest on the Lord. So God has given this, this free gift of choice. Now, the very good thing is, the Bible says in Proverbs, many other plans in the mind of man, but it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. So we come up with these plans and, and uh, these neat ideas, but the reality is that God is in, always in the business of something good. So he looks at what our choices are and what our will may be, and he holds it up to what his uh, determination would be our best course of action. So very, very often the thing is, we all know, very often the things that we ask for don't come to fruition because they're really not going to benefit us down the road. Now the other thing I wanted to look at originally when I penned this is how do habits and routine affect our growth? And 1 Corinthians 10.31 says, whatever you do, do for the glory of God. So everything that we do should glorify God, not ourselves, but God. 
So let's define what a habit is. A habit is a repeating set of unconscious thoughts, feelings, and actions that get settled in our lives. So it's not, probably should jot this one down, it's not practice that makes perfect, it's practice that makes permanent. See, when you get on the phone and you go to Angie's List and look for some tradesmen that just really excel in regard to the trade that they have, the reason why they excel is because they've done whatever they're doing just a numerous amount of times, time and time again. So repetition is king. So a habit is something that we put in place and after a whole bunch of repetitive times becomes second nature. Now, not to bore you, but our brain really is divided into really two parts. And the part is, part of it is the, what they call, psychologists call the cognitive part, and that's the part where we think and then there's this whole other section in your brain called the subconscious. So what happens is all the habits that you have in place from getting up from the same side of the bed and getting your favorite coffee mug and walking over to the coffee pot, all those habits go into the subconscious part of your brain. Example of that is, have you ever driven to work? You know, maybe you've been working there for 30 years and you get there and you say, man, I don't even remember driving here. How many people have done that before? Yeah. And the reason for this is that your brain, and yeah, your brain and my brain, for the most part, is lazy. The brain is constantly looking for activities and actions that you can do to turn them into a habit. Because the minute we turn it into a habit, it takes less energy for the brain to work each day. Make sense? So you have your conscious mind and you have your Subconscious mind. The problem is when we get a hold of a habit that is less than beneficial, it very often takes us uh, off the highway of health and, and moving forward and growth to a place that we never should be. So how do we grow and how do we put habits in our life that are really going to benefit us? Here's a famous quote. Ready for this one? There's no elevator to grow. You've got to take the stairs. There's no elevator to grow you got to take the stairs. What that means is, is that our biggest enemy, both as believers and non-believers, is the word average. Because if our charge or our goal each day is just to be pyre or just to kind of be like everyone else in the world, we're really not going to make a dent in this world like God calls us to. I'll let you in a little secret. Uh, the internet is not going to change the world in a positive way more than you can, all right? So we've seen the internet come in and, you know, how we communicate has changed dramatically, but the ability to really uh, converse with people, reach into their heart, and help them get to a, a, a better place is going to take some growth on our part. So this whole growth thing, this whole ability to move forward is that we have the ability to... Uh, affect people in a very positive way. Let's go a little further. Now, how do habits, how do habits come about? I can tell you what the stats say. They, it takes, probably should jot this down, it takes about 70, 62 days, pardon me, of a consecutive action, a repeated action to become a habit. That is where it switches from the, the, the cognitive part of your brain to the subconscious part of your brain, about 62 days. And, and once that happens, we go into this habit mode. Now, how habits are come up each day is that very often there are what psychologists call triggers or cues. That's the on button for the habit. Now, this is called the famous habit loop. And how this works is we have a trigger on the left-hand side we have a routine that we follow, and then, of course, a reward. I'll give you an example. So if I drive by Dunkin' Donuts, and I'm on another perpetual diet, and I smell the beautiful aroma <laughs> of fresh cooked donuts in the morning, that's my what? Q or trigger, OK? So then I take that big one-ton truck of mine, and I start turning that wheel, 
and instead of going to work, I pull that big one-ton truck right in the parking lot of Dunkin' Donuts, and I buy more donuts known to mankind, and I fill my truck up, and that's the reward. So that whole <laughs> habitual loop all starts with a cue or a trigger. Let me give you another example. Now, as we look at habits, uh, a lot of psychologists like to call it the big hook. Because what happens in the business world, because most of this stuff can be related to the business world, is that uh, businessmen, business people, use habits all the time to kind of make sales in a very dramatic way, case in point. Uh, there's what we call immediate triggers and delayed triggers. Immediate triggers are, for example, when I drove by McDonald's and I smelled the aroma of the donuts, that's an immediate trigger and I acted upon it immediately. Now we also can have in our life what they call uh, delayed triggers. Delayed triggers are, for example, let's see, if I sent you a text and said, you know, when you get out of work, uh, go to this website and check out uh, the new uh, variety of corn that people are planting. So that's a trigger. That's something that you're not gonna do right away, but down the road you're gonna do that. So there's two basically uh, types of triggers in regard to intensity. The ones usually that get us in a lot of trouble are the immediate ones, as you would expect. Okay, the big one is the movie theater. The thing that's ironic is that when movie theaters started, uh, they wanted to serve food because they wanted to make those extra dollars, but they wanted to kind of mirror some of the famous opera houses that had real quality food, and they really were uh, reluctant to put popcorn in the picture. But uh, people like popcorn. People struggle at home to make popcorn. Remember the Jiffy Poppy and they burnt to charcoal? How many people have done that before, right? So what happened is, happens is that the movie theater start a, started to incorporate uh, popcorn, and most of the popcorn that you eat, you know what the data says? It's at least five, five days old because after the movie, the popcorn sits until the next movie theater comes open again and people come in. But movie theaters make 46% of their profits from popcorn. That's why it's so expensive. So what they do is you sit there and the movie's just about to start and what do they do? They use psychology. What's the trigger? Smell and what, the picture of? Popcorn. Now, the sad part is, if you're anything like me, I don't need to be hungry to eat. And <laughs> my wife is chuckling. And that's what the movie theater is kind of banking on, right? So they make this subliminal uh, uh, image up there on the screen that drives us to the concession stand to buy some popcorn. So we have trigger, we have an action, and then finally a reward. Now, are there times in your life that you're more sensitive to triggers than others? I did some research on this. Take a look. And I, I think this kind of makes sense to me. If, if, if and when people uh, act on triggers, uh, it generally has a lot to do with their emotional and physical state. You ever heard people that were on a diet and got upset, and what they do is make their way to the refrigerator? That's the first thing they do. So, yeah. <laughs> So your emotional and physical state many times uh, has a lot of input, input in regard to if you follow the trigger. The time of day is another one. You know, we get late in the afternoon and say we're hungry, and then, uh, you know, we see a commercial, we hear a commercial on, on the radio, and that's a trigger, and it drives us to purchase uh, what we probably don't need. The other part of uh, profound input in regard to triggers is people that you have in your life. Uh, the data, very, very strong data from Stanford's, uh, they've done extensive studies. And what they found is take the five uh, people in your life that you spend most time with, pardon me, and 45% of your actions and your feelings are driven by the people that you hang with. So, case in point, if all your friends tend to be a little chubby or overweight, 
uh, there's a 47% higher inclination that you're going to be the same. And I'm not saying you turn your back on chubby people because you're looking at one, but understand <laughs> that the people you hang with has a dramatic effect in regard to where you're going to be as in regard to a goal. <laughs> Another item is prior events. You know, if something went awry early in the morning and you've kind of been dragging that along uh, for some time, very often we're crippled by past uh, negative emotions uh, in that whole negative uh, loop that we can't seem to get out of. We got up one foot dragging in the past and one in the present. It ends up uh, dragging us to a place we should never be. And then finally, finally, environment and location has a lot to do. Now, what we're going to find out is, is that when I talk in just a few minutes about incorporating habits that are going to cause you to grow dramatically or exponentially, one of the things you're going to find out is that we're going to take these items right here and we're going to reverse them. I'm going to give you some examples, all right? I can tell you tomorrow morning, if you follow some of the behavioral science and scriptures that I'm going to share with you, it will change your life dramatically. Promise. Okay, let's go forward. What I found out was I, I really did a, uh, I took a couple of days and I, I studied really successful people. And of course, in the Christian realm, our definition of success is uh, vastly different than people in the work world or in the co our culture world. But what you find out is if you follow positive people, um, which, and Christians as well, what you find out is that their not-to-do list is a lot larger than their to-do list. That's probably something you ought to jot down. You know, those, those are areas in our life that we say, you know, we're not, we're not going there because that's going to take us to a place we shouldn't be. You know, when I work with uh, or have worked with people with addictive behaviors, one of the verse, very first questions I ask them is, you know, who's in your life? You know. Are there people in your life that are causing you to, to make the right decision to, to, to go the right way? Sadly, some of the relationships that you have and I have had in the past, they're kind of born relationships. That's our family. But my response to that is that there's, there's some folks that are going to be in your life, quite frankly, and there's some folks that are in my life that we have to live, a f love, pardon me, afar. You still love them. But in regard to the uh, interaction with them, you've got to be careful in regard to you don't take some of those one out of five people that you hang with a lot, right? So we've got to be intentional about having some folks in your life that are going to cause you to walk in the right direction. Makes a lot of sense because, you know, if we don't take time to take a really candid look at who's making deposits in our life, uh, we end up going to the wrong bank. Now, one of the toughest things uh, when I work with people is they, they struggle, they seem to struggle with, you know, how do we incorporate a good habit into maybe another habit that's going on? Not necessarily a bad habit. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. So, so is there a, is there a, a scientific methodology uh, or an analytic path that we could take or should take in regard to adding habits? This is kind of cool, and just maybe you can kind of glean some, some stuff for your own life. So, so what you do is you get a sheet of paper tonight, and, and you draw a line down the middle. And on the left side, you make a list of existing habits, which shouldn't take you too long. So if you think about it, you know, you get up, you get, on the, you get up on the same side of the bed, you go to the bathroom, uh, you get your favorite coffee cup, you go brush your teeth. Those are all what? Ingrained habits. Now, is that the cognitive part of your brain? No, it's the subconscious part. So those are habits that are what? Ongoing. Now, in psychology, to add a habit, the easiest way to do that is to add what they call a pigtail habit. That means you take a habit that you want to start to incorporate it in your life, and you hook it to an existing habit. Let me give you an example. Let's say you went to the dentist, or I'll pick on myself. Let's say I went to the dentist and the dentist said, you know, Tom, you're doing a great job brushing your teeth, but you're not flossing as much as you should. So being a wise guy that I am, I said, well, I'll, I'll just really floss the teeth I care about. And he laughs. 
So how do I instill the idea of flossing uh, and to make that a habit? So now, when I get up, uh, I make my way to, a, to the sink, which is habitual, hopefully, right? And I go to brush my teeth. And now, when I go to brush my teeth, I do not leave that sink until I at least, I, I least floss at least three teeth. And I do that for about seven days. And on the eighth day, I go from three teeth to six teeth. And in another week, I go from six teeth to 12 teeth. And I know you're doing your math and you're counting how many teeth you have in your head. But what happens is the pigtail wanted habit gets hooked onto the what? Existing habit. And that same method that I just shared with you can be used for anything. So we create a pathway from the existing habit to the new habit. Now the thing that makes this work is being motivated to change in this whole process. I mean, that's the key. You know, some of the, some of the, I shake my head because some of the folks that I've worked with in the past, they have great goals, but the problem is they don't have any action plans to go with them. You see, and we're gonna talk after break, I'm gonna talk about how to develop goals that become ready for this, magnetic. Because when a goal has an action plan, all of a sudden, that goal turns from a dream to a reality. It's a magnetic pull to get you to a place where you need to be. And I'm gonna teach you some methods or tools that you can put in your own life toolbox to help you get to a place where you need to be. Famous quote by B.J. Fogg, kind of a neat guy. He's got a ton of quotes in regard to growth and change. And he said, put an immediate trigger in the pathway of a motivated person and bingo, you got to have it, okay? So you got to be motivated that you want to get to a place where you need to be. Now I'm excited tonight and I'm, I'm, I'm excited because seven years ago, I stumbled, actually stumbled across this whole methodology and I started to change my life, I think, in a very positive way. Uh, I wanted to get my, real quick, because this seminar is not about me, it's you, about you, but I'm gonna take just 30 seconds. Seven years ago, I wanted to get my PhD in clinical psychology, so I called a couple of think tanks, and of the three that I called, all said I had to repeat some courses. Um, I had to repeat my clinical. I did six months at a psychiatric, psychiatric pardon me, facility in New York City, uh, I did three months in an amputee ward at a vet hospital in New York City. I did two months at a children's hospital and they wanted me to repeat all that stuff. So I got thinking, you know, I'm 68 years old. It's gonna cost me about $70,000 to do that. And really my goal is to help people. And I didn't need a plaque on a wall. I didn't need applause or accolades, but I wanted the, the tools to help people. So what I did was, I know you're gonna think I need therapy myself, but I went to the internet <laughs> and I investigated the suggesting reading of all PhD levels in clinical psychology seven years ago. So then what I did was there's this formula called the 10,000 hour formula. And what that basically says is if you take three hours a day for seven consecutive years, you can for the most part master anything you want to master. So I set up my environment. I got up at 4.30 in the morning for seven consecutive years, read a book a week. And I'm not saying I'm where I need to be, but I'm so much further ahead than I was. And I pick on myself, not because I want you to pat me on the back, because certainly I got my issues and things that I want to change in my life. But I can tell you, if we uh, take the stairs, <clears throat> pardon me, instead of the elevator to grow, you can do some, some dramatic things in regard to your life and how valuable you are going to be to, to God. And I think one of the uh, things that needs to happen is, you know, how valuable do you, cons how valuable do you consider yourself to God? I mean, are you a minimum wage believer? Or are you a six-figure wage earner? Well, it's related to business. Now, I didn't invent this, but for the most part, people that get minimum wage, and I'm not picking on them, that's a place where I once walked, but minimum wage people don't bring, and I don't mean this in a negative way, but in regard to skills, 
they, they could be wonderful people, that, but generally, generally, they don't bring a lot of value to the table. You see, I can take two brothers that went to the same high school that are only a year apart and hire both of them, and within a year, one is still at minimum wage and the other one's making six figures. And you know what the reason is? They bring value to the table. So my question for myself was, you know, how valuable am I to God? I mean, do I really want to make a difference? So my goal was, and I made the goal magnetic, we're going to talk about that, is that I made a goal to get to a place where I needed to be, to really be helpful to people, to get them to a place where they need to be. That's why I said earlier, I am not a, uh, a speaker that pats people on the back, and not that I don't do that, but I'm in the change business. I help people find out where they are, and then put the necessary skills and abilities in place so they can get to a place where they need to be. You see, we can wish to do this and wish to do that, but generally speaking, we lack the skill sets to do that, right? So, so my challenge for you folks tonight as we go through this whole process of habits and routines is, you know, what are some habits and routines to help you get to a place where you need to be? Now, one of the stumbling blocks that seem to be uh, present with people is uh, when I ask folks, you know, what are your goals? A lot of people really don't have any real specific goals. So, so how, do you, how do you develop a list of goals? Why don't we start there, right? So write down on your notes a list of goals. What I tell folks is start with 10 goals, 10 places you would like to see your life in the next year. So in my case, I wanted to be more fluid in clinical psychology. Uh, so my very first book, which was like watching paint dry, <laughs> was called The Psychiatric Interview. <laughs> it was about that thick, and I'm a reader, and it took me a while to get through and, and comprehend and understand it. But that was my very first goal. So you set the goals. So come up with, with five or 10 goals that you identify as that you would like to have on your belt. Then I want you to take your scissors and I want you to cut that list down to three. Um, because the fact is, if you have too many goals out there, you never end up doing any of them, all right? So identify one, two, or three goals that you would like to work on, and then you write them down. Now, I said earlier, if you have a goal and you write it down, but you don't come up with an action plan, the problem is the goal does not become magnetic, all right? So, I'll pick on myself. So my goal was to study three hours a day for seven consecutive years. And I studied uh, famous artists and musicians and people that are very good at what they do. And what I found out is they very seldom miss two workouts consecutively in a week. They may miss one, but they very seldom miss two in a consecutive week. So my goal was to do the seven-year gig, three hours a day. Now, the other thing is, sadly, I tend to lie to myself sometimes. So what I did was I took a small mason jar, I know I'm sick, and I put 180 paper clips in the mason jar, and I set it on my desk with a lid. And when I finish my three hours of study for that day, I take that mason jar and I turn it upside down. And when I get up tomorrow morning, my goal is to spend another 188 minutes study, and I take that mason jar when I'm done again, and I take it and I what? Flip it. And there's no way I can lie to myself because the mason jar is an indicator that I've done the work that, you know, I was called to do. So there's all kinds of tricks out there that, you know, I'm, I'm be glad to share with you in regard to help you stay in that task thing. So, so identify the goal that what you want to get. Let's say uh, you want to learn how to play guitar, or you want to preach the gospel, um, or you want to uh, you want to become an EMT. You know, those are all great goals for you to follow, but we got to put some action plans on. Now, remember earlier I said that some of the things that are detrimental to goals. Remember that list I gave you. Well, let's go back and take a look at that for a minute. Let's see if I, if I can find that. All right. Now I'll pick on myself. All right, so my goal was to learn clinical psychology. So one of the things that I wanted to get to is, you know, 
your emotions and my emotions, uh, that's what drives your bus every day. That's the bus driver, your emotions. I take a deep breath because um, every person that you run into in your lifetime, every situation that you come across, your brain takes a snapshot. I won't tell you uh, medically what happens, but your brain takes a snapshot and, and takes a, uh, an emotion and ties an emotion to that person or situation that came up. And all of a sudden, we have this loop that is driven by emotions. Now, sometimes it becomes problematic because people get stuck in the past. Case in point, people go through some horrific trauma. They lose a loved one or they go through divorce. So they think of that person, there's a tied emotion to it, and sometimes as they go through the day, they see an old picture, uh, they hear a conversation, um, they maybe see that person or that situation may come up from afar, and all of a sudden that whole emotional loop starts to play again. Um, the healthiest place psychologically that you and I could be on any given days when our emotions are short-lived. We get in a problem when we elongate the emotions. In psychology, it's called rumination thought. That means you take a thought, it keeps what? Playing and playing and playing, and that's not a place to be. Um, pick, a, pick a time of day that works for you. You know, for me, it's 4.30 in the morning. I know I'm sick, but that works for me. There's, I tell you, no one calls me on the cell phone at 4.30 in the morning. If they do, they're as sick as I am, all right? So pick, <laughs> pick a time of day that works for you. Third one, surround yourself with some people who are going to help you get to the place where you need to be. I call them, I don't, people call them confidants. Those are people that talk less about themselves and talk more about you. If you got someone that you consider a confidant and he or she ends up talking more about themselves, then you probably ought to switch gears in the midst of that, right? So get some people that are gonna kind of help you move forward into the goal that you wanna follow. You need a cheerleader. It's someone on the sidelines that says, come on, you can do this. You missed yesterday, you can't miss today. Give me a break. Get your books and start studying. I can tell you tonight in clear conscience, ready for this? You need to write this down in, in dark capital letters in your notes. Ready? Everything you need to know, we talked about this in Sunday school today, everything you need to know is found in a book. Starts with the Bible and it works down. When you woke up this morning, you are part of the greatest informational age that people have ever lived in. So what happens is ignorance is a choice. You know, when I became a teacher when dinosaurs roamed the earth, our big thing was what we, <laughs> what we were gonna teach students. And now it's so much more than that because it's not enough to just to know the what, we need to know the how or the why to get from point A to point B. All right, so, so you set up these goals, you come up with some action plans, you look at your emotional state, you look at the time of day people that you have uh, in place, and then, you know, what are some prior events that you can set up in your life? You know, there's some things you need to be intentional about. Some years ago, I wrote an article for uh, Reader's Digest, that's how old I am, and uh, they sent a beautiful form letter back. They said, Mr. Bonacani, we appreciated your article, uh, but it was just too preachy for our, our, for our magazine. And that was fine, that was a learning lesson for me. But that spurred me on uh, to kind of move forward. I always tell people that, you know, if you're gonna move forward, part of that whole process is, ready? Failure. But my take on it is to fail quick. You know, look at what doesn't work, because what doesn't work ends up to be an arrow what what does work. I took, took my grandkids to uh, Thomas Edison's workshop in Florida last month, his laboratory. You know, talk about a man on a mission. You know, he slept, he had his bed uh, in his laboratory. I don't know what his wife thought of that, but he would, <laughs> he would work, and I'm a shop rat, he would work in a shop day in and day out. And when he went to uh, invent the electric light bulb, 
he failed 1,000 times. You know, if you look at his compound there, he had all these tropical plants growing for ideas for a filament that would last. I mean, they'd light up, but they were the very short-lived. Well, it took a 1,000 attempts to get the light bulb. I'll tell you how uh, excited he was about learning and to move forward is that uh, when he got tired, he would sit in his office chair. I took a picture of his chair. I got it on my phone. And he had a, a two-inch uh, stainless steel ball bearing that he would hold in his hand. And right below him was a steel plate. And his thought was, you know, I, when I sleep, I just waste so much time. So he would take a, a little cat nap. And when he really uh, relaxed and uh, really got to that little nap sleep stage, he would release his hand, the ball bearing would leave his hand, hit the steel plate, make a wicked racket, and what? Wake him up, and he'd get up and go back to work again. Now, I'm not saying <laughs> that we got to follow that, uh, that blueprint for, for being energized to work at the study, but, you know, I think there's some, there's some kernels of truth there that, you know, we have to really push ourselves to get to a place where we need to be. So it's not a matter of looking where you are, it's a matter of, probably should jot this down, it's more a matter of what you can be, or what you can develop to. But failure certainly is part of this whole equation. But like I said, fail quick. Here's another real common question I get. You know, what's, when's the best time to start some of these habits that you want to put in place? Let's say you got some goals and you want to put them in your place, in, you want to put them in place, pardon me, in your life. Is it early morning? Is it mid-afternoon? Is it late afternoon? The answer to that is early morning and late afternoon. And I'll tell you why. They, not to bore you, but in about 2000, uh, 2002, uh, they really started to do tremendous work in neuroscience. Neuroscience is uh, taking biology and psychology and physical health and looking at that whole pattern and come up with a game plan. And what they found out was they started to do these uh, probe mappings on people's brains when they were getting uh, counseled by psychologists. See, before that, there's, uh, there was research, and they did their own thing, and therapists and psychologists did their own, their own thing, and they never would meet. But then someone had a bright idea, wait a minute, shouldn't, be, shouldn't we be kind of uh, keeping track of what's going on in the brain when people are getting counseled or when they're fighting with anxiety or depression? So they started to do this, this uh, mind mapping, and since in the last 19 years, they have learned more about health mental health and psychology in the last 2,000 years prior to that. All because uh, this mind mapping that's called uh, neurobiology, that's, that's the study how, how a brain works and how a brain fires. Every time you get a new skill, there's this whole uh, connection that takes place in your brain. Uh, there's a chem, not to bore you, but there's this chemical called, called dopamine that's released in your brain that almost fires you up to keep learning and learning and learning. And that's the cool thing. So as we, as we pick these goals and we do these action steps, understand even though uh, it's difficult, you know, for example, study is, is difficult at best sometimes, but it, it pays tremendous dividends. So, so the best time to bring a habit in place is early morning, I'll tell you why. What they found out through neurobiology is that our brain is only capable of so many decisions in a day, correct decisions. What happens is it's called uh, weary thinking. We're good to about 11 to 12 o'clock in the afternoon and then all of a sudden our ability to really think and, and think correctly starts to drop. So for example, if you're gonna uh, schedule uh, a physical appointment with a doctor where they're gonna do some surgery, your best bet, <laughs> for averages to turn out for the best is in the morning. They, uh, I think it wasn't Harvard, I think it was, uh, Stanford did a study, if you're watching this, I apologize if I have that wrong, but I think it's Stanford. 
what they found out was they took all the courtrooms in the United States for a year uh, that uh, had to make decisions regard to awarding parole to people in prison. And what they found out was that judges from about 9 o'clock in the morning to about 12 o'clock did fine in regard to the decisions. 67% of the judges awarded uh, parole to people that were in jail. After 12 o'clock, their ability to award uh, parole dropped like a stone. And the reason is the judges did not want to make a mistake in a negative way and to award parole to someone they weren't quite sure that they should. So you can take you can take court judges, you can take physicians, you can take school teachers, but we do our best best thinking early in the morning. Here's an old adage that probably should go on your notes. Ready? I'll go slow. So goes the first two hours, so goes the day. That's where your willpower is the strongest. That's when your mental decision process is the strongest. So if you're going to pick a time of day, morning is best. The second best is late afternoon. The other thing that's enter into this, and I'd be uh, neglectful if I didn't mention in regard to uh, sleep deprivation. The other thing is light deprivation. There's been a tremendous amount of studies in 2017 that said that you and I need at least an hour of sunlight every morning. And what that does is reschedule the brain, the, our brains to get to a place where it needs to be. So for me, uh, I remember my eye doctor said, you know, you got blue eyes. You, from the morning you get up, from the minute you get up, you need to wear sunglasses. Well, I buy that, but this, all this new study uh, suggests that we need to take sunglasses off and at least for the first hour, absorb as much as that vitamin D from the sun as we can, and it pays tremendous dividend. Does that make sense? So get up, take a deep breath, get outside. You know, we're battling our kids and our grandkids. They're stuck inside. I'm going to take a sledgehammer someday and slam all the iPads. I've got to be careful because i got three. But, <laughs> but we got to get outside, right? So, so, okay. Now, one of the dilemmas is that as people, we hear what people say and we read in books, but sometimes we're not really able to explain the process. My dad used to say, smart guy, spoke three languages, retired, uh, hired a, uh, an artist from Soho in New York City to teach him watercolor. Uh, the next year, my poor mother was pulling her hair out. He hires a concert pianist to teach him piano. In a year, uh, he was playing piano and organ at the church. Uh, then he wanted to become uh, very proficient in tennis. He hired a tennis pro from Long Island that spent a year with him and taught him how to uh, play tennis, and he taught tennis for the county. What I, what I want to say is that you've got a lot of life ahead of you. You know, start grabbing hold of the stuff that you want to do. Don't have in your conversation what you can do. You, might, you need to start having some stuff, I'm preaching to myself too, stuff that you want to do, stuff that's going to make a profound effect in people. Okay, let's go on. Now, why do, why do people get motivated to change? This is one of my favorite slides. Bar none, the highest, once again, this is one of those ones you need to write in capital letters on your notes. The highest motivator for change is regret. Now, if you're in my, I think it was two seminars ago, I, I did a study or a teaching on the sting of a regret. Now, sadly, regret uh, takes people down a road sometimes that's very, very unhealthy because they get stuck in that. Remember, now you're scholars in that habit loop, but they get stuck in a negative habit loop of regret. So what happens is they keep wallowing in a place that they shouldn't be. They keep uh, hanging out in the past, and they never get to a place where they need to be. But the other thing that regret does, <clears throat> excuse me, is that regret very often spurs people on to change their life. Uh, I spent a lot of time uh, working with people with addictive behaviors. Back in the 70s, I was working with uh, vets that were coming back yet from Vietnam that were uh, addicted to heroin, and we had them on uh, methadone program and, uh, and all of that. And, and what you find out with is that you know, people very often get to a point where they look at their life and they're just very regretful because it's not a place where they want to be or thought that they would be. Let me give you a nurse around you. You can help me finish it. I haven't lost my marbles, honest. Ready? Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. Help me finish. All the king's horses, 
and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty what back together again. Let me let you let me uh, let you in on a little hint. Humpty wasn't pushed. Okay. Uh, all of us sometimes wake up in the morning and we say, "How did we ever get here?" And the reason is, is that we've made a series of choices, usually uh, downward towards the downward slope. Now we don't get bad overnight, or we don't make poor choices overnight. Usually, poor choices are small, incremental steps the wrong way, and very seldom is it a big, giant step. Well, we don't get better overnight either. It's what. A series of what? Small incremental steps this time in the right direction. But the whole idea of getting better is direction determines what? Destination. And this whole direction thing is just so uh, needful of both study and people, prayer time, and the Lord to help you get to a place where you need to go. And that's, you know, that's very, very doable. The very sad thing is that we very often get surrounded by negative people. I'll let you in a little secret because I deal with folks like that all the time is that negative people like the company of other negative people. You know, and disgruntled people love the company of what? Disgruntled people. So they make a phone call and say, let's do lunch. Well, they don't want to do lunch. They want to talk about what's wrong with the world. So they get in this whole negative loop, right? And they end up dragging countless people down the wrong path. So you want to be positive? You want to get to a place where you need to be? Start surrounding yourself with some positive people. People that are going to encourage you. People are going to kick you in the butt when you need to be kicked in the butt. And say, wait a minute, you missed your study time yesterday. You didn't work out yesterday. What's the deal? Where's your paper clips in the jar, man? I haven't been turned in a week. Give me a break. Okay, let's go on. <laughs> the other thing that... Uh, Oh, I didn't finish the regret. So I, I had lunch uh, last year with uh, a therapist uh, from, I won't say where, but one of the local uh, programs in Syracuse and was retired. I said, what's your biggest challenge that you faced? And he's helped a lot of people. And he said, Tom, you know, it's ironic, but he said, he said, my biggest challenge is that when people want help and they're regretful in regard to opportunities that they had slipped through their hands, it's very often a very short window when they want to do that. And if the right people aren't around at the right time, timing is everything, we miss that opportunity. So when someone starts knocking at your door and they're regretful in regard to what's happened in their life, we've got to take action just as soon as we can. Because if you wait long enough, it's gone. I always tell, this is a good one to write down, you know, good ideas have a short shelf life. Okay. Goldfish, when you go feed your goldfish, they're good for about five seconds to pay attention to what you're doing. <laughs> well, humans aren't much better. Uh, our is like, ours is like five or six seconds. So if you have a good intention, if you wait past five or six ses seconds, guess what? It's gone. Strike when the iron is hot. All right, crisis and trauma very often cause people to change their life. Now, it's sad that that's got to happen. When people go through trauma, very often they get sucked into this negative feel feeling loop uh, that's very difficult to break out of. Remember me saying a couple of minutes ago that every situation that comes up in your life from now, what's happened in the past and in the future, your brain takes a what? Snapshot and then tacks a sticky note of motion to it. And it's, if it's very traumatic, like a divorce or someone passes away or a fight in a relationship or a fractured relationship, that emotion, like I said earlier, drives the bus, just keeps repeating, repeating, and repeating, and people get stuck in the past. Rejection. People re get rejected from their families, uh, from the relationship that they have. You know, in every relationship that you have, whether you're working, turning wrenches, or you're a teacher, or you're a parent or a grandparent, excuse me, in every relationship, there's expectations that people bring to the table. And people get unhooked emotionally, and people get unhooked spiritually because many times the expectations were never voiced, or the expecta expectations were voiced, but they were broken. So 
we live in a world, sadly, that are just filled with broken people. But the good news is that, unlike Humpty Dumpty, uh, where all the king's men couldn't put him together, God is in the business of what? Putting us back together. That's why God is, you know, preach. I'm not a preacher. I don't even know if I can spell preacher, but I can tell you that God is in the redemptive business. That means he has the ability to grab us by the hand in love and help us get to a place where he needs to be. And it's very often people that he puts in your life and my life in order to do that. When we hit rock bottom, when we look up and say, how did I ever end up here? Well, some choices that you made that weren't the best. You know, when my dad took tennis, I said, well, dad, how are you doing with the tennis deal? And my mother's like pulling her hair out, right? He wanted to buy a Steinway piano, and the list just goes on and on. He said, well, he said, you want to know what my goal is? I said, what's your goal in tennis, Dad? He says, I want to make more right shots than wrong shots. Hmm. Same thing in life, right? So, so the closer we get to God and God starts tugging on our heart, we ought to start making more right shots than wrong shots. There ought to be this observable wake, just like a boat leaves a wake. There ought to be this observable wake that we're following uh, the leadership of God and not the leadership of man. And that ought to be very observable. I said earlier that our biggest enemy as believers probably is change. And the second one is being average. You and I ought to stick out like a sore thumb. I mean, we ought to say things that no one else says. We ought to do things that no one else would do. You know, and wherever you go, that next Thanksgiving dinner when you got family members want to reach across the table, knock the turkey over and strangle each other, Things ought to get better because you're there, because you have Christ in your heart. And you have this ability just to calm things down. You should have this tremendous calming effect on people that, that are having a difficult time in life because you have Christ in your heart. Not that we're perfect. You know, we're on this journey called sanctification. That's a process. You know, it's a process that God makes us a new creature in Christ. Well, it's God plants a seed, and it's our responsibility to grow. It was pretty preachy, wasn't it? Okay, uh, we tend to get motivated sometimes when we're fearful, right? We're fear of a person, and so we start to make changes. We make environmental changes. We make changes in relationships, how much time we spend with people. So fear very often drives uh, people to a different change. And the other one is social acceptance. I take a deep breath because I think some of the worst uh, villains uh, for lack of social acceptance is kids. You know, I got a bushel of grandkids and I love them. You know, I was a teacher for 31 years and I love kids. But what I found out was they sometimes can be just so cruel to each other, right? So, so what happens is people go through life and uh, their uh, value is tremendously diminished because of what negative inputs people have put into their life. You know, for a while there, Linda and I were doing a Bible study at a local home for, for men. Very Many of them were struggling with alcohol. And, and what we found out was that our very first chore or on our to-do list with those guys, those all men, was that their image of themselves was just terrible because they've made poor choices undoubtedly, but they had scores of people that say, you are worthless. You threw your marriage away, you threw your job away, you are worthless. Well, guess what? God is in a worthless business, you know? So, so one of the things that motivates people is they, they're filled with regret. You know, I, I was uh, uh, blessed uh, this year to be at the bedside of two people that passed away. One was my mom and one was my brother. My brother was a vet. Uh, he died of leukemia. And uh, in both cases, I, I remember talking to my mom like a day before she passed, pretty sharp, even right to the end. She was 94 years old. She was in assisted living in Florida. And I said, Mom, do you have any, real sharp, I said, do you have any regrets that you thought a minute? She said, no, I've had a good life. And she meant, I mean, she was sincere. But a lot of people have broken relationships, and because of that, uh, they're only firing on six cylinders rather than eight, okay? Uh, if you look at the data in regard to the top two regrets, you know what the first one is? Fractured relationships. And you know what the second one is? Missed opportunities. It could be missed 
educational opportunities. It could be missed opportunities to uh, get a job or, you know, the list is endless. But, you know, regret, even though it can be terribly negative, it, it also can be a positive game changer. Okay, man, I've been gabbing for an hour, so why don't we do this, okay? Uh, you got a three by five card. If you feel comfortable doing that, that's fine. Just jot down one or two questions that you might have, and we'll do a little Q&A. Why don't we take uh, like a 15 minute break, and uh, I'll make some noise here when we're gonna get back. So why don't you... Okay, boy, this is an important slide of all the slides that we going to go through. Let me make a couple of statements in regard to habit, okay? Put your pens down a minute because I want to get to this right here. Ready? Okay. The reality is, I'm going to just make it, I'm just going to say it. Your brain does not care if you adopt a good habit or a bad habit. Your brain is only concerned with putting a habit in place. Does that make sense? So it's our responsibility to write herd on uh, habits and routines that we have in place. God calls us that, right? And the Bible says a lot, but one, one scripture that just jumps off the pages, be not conformed to this world, but what? Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So we read the scriptures, uh, we look at our life and say, wait a minute, that's not where I am, and I know that's not the place I want to be. So I want to look uh, at the place I want to be. All right, so, so remember, your brain, my brain, especially my brain, is really lazy, and it's always looking for opportunities to take your actions during the day and turn them into habits. You know, some of the vets that I worked with years ago in the 70s, they were like, oh, man, I just, I, I just can't break this. I just, I get up in the morning, that's all I think about. And, and you know, <clears throat> if you, and I've studied uh, all the uh, programs in the United States that have the best batting averages. And you know the ones that have the best bat batting averages? The ones that are spiritually based. Because you can't do this on your own. You gotta, you gotta have spiritual intervention from God to do it, right? I always tell people that all the time. One of the things that the Bible gets very high marks for it, it has, the scriptures have, I was just talking about this, has tremendous utility to it. Okay, Billy, you wrote this nice question. Why don't you verbally stand up nice and loud and, and recite that question that you have for us? Okay, let's talk about that for a minute. Did you, everyone hear the question? How do you get over the regret? I think that's what your question is in regard to missed opportunities. Okay. Okay. Now, you got, you got, psychologically, you got two pathways, all right? Like if I was sitting down with you and we were talking about this. Number one is, uh, in, in God's realm, uh, there's no rear view mirror in the car. Uh, in our faith as born again believers, uh, there's only one piece of glass and that's the front windshield. Uh, the Bible talks a lot about not taking your hands off the plow and looking backwards. Pastor Glenn just preached about that not too long ago. So if you have the regret, regret of missed opportunities, that's something that you, we got to lose that. And you got to come to a place where you start uh, cultivating new opportunities in your life, okay? The very exciting thing, I think, at least in my little corner of the world, is that with God's help, you and I have the ability to rewrite our future. I mean, how cool is that? I mean, if we do, if we leave here tonight, we virtually do nothing. We virtually do nothing. We're just going to repeat the last five years. And I don't know about you, you know, I'm 68, I did the math, my life expectancy maybe is 84. If you're in your 30s, your life expectancy is in the low 90s, so you've got lots of time. But in my case, you know, I looked at the time I have left, and 
missed opportunities. I shared with my wife the other day, and I think Chris was there too. I said, you know, I really wasted a large portion of my life, you know, because going back, I just would have went to medical school and been a clinical psychiatrist. And my wife uh, gave me a slap on the side of the head, not literally, but she said, you know, look, you were a teacher. Look at all the lives that you have affected, all right? So we can look back and be regretful in regard to opportunities we didn't take. But the very good news, Billy, as long as we get out of bed and we're drawing a breath, we're going to have future opportunities to uh, grab a hold of. And, and God's in that business. That's why God is called sovereign. You know, from the first bud that shows up on the trees this spring to the last leaf that falls off in the fall, that all goes through the, the hands of God. So my prayer every morning is God use me in a valuable way. You know, send me some people that I can help. You know? Becky, nice and loud. <clears throat> yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, I've also heard it called <clears throat> Becky v v validity, a validity checkout, which means uh, you look at the thought that comes in. So if it's a regretful thought in regard to a missed opportunity, one of the first things you need to do is check the validity of the thought. I mean, for a lot of people that struggle with negative emotions and, and missed opportunities, their, their uh, uh, view of what could have happened very often is skewed, and it may never, ever come up to fruition. And the bottom line is that it does no good to look backwards. You know, you were here last month, and I said that the very best place for us to live every single day is the present. We put both feet in the present, but we keep one eye on the future. And what that eye on the future does is give us uh, this tremendous forward motion of a person we could be, rather than a person what we are. Make sense, Billy? So even though we sometimes battle with regret, that's an emotion that's got to head south because it's not going to do us any good. All right, some of the things that uh, unhook us, <clears throat> negative emotions, fear, and shame. I, the biggest villain in this whole list is shame. We could spend a whole semester just on shame. I mean, uh, people that do horrific things on the news that you see, uh, a lot of that stuff is, is shame-driven. I studied uh, some of the training manuals that the FBI uses to uh, uh, profile people. Linda gets tired of me sharing that with her at the airport as we sit down and see people that walk by. But uh, <laughs> one of the terrible drivers in people's lives is shame because it causes people to do stuff that is just totally unnatural. Okay? So that's, that's a ter terrible inhibitive in regard to bringing positive change in your life. So you gotta, you got to talk to a professional. Now, sometimes. I take a deep breath, but sometimes, you know, we got to go to someone that's got a shingle out front, that's a therapist or a counselor or a pastor, and just share those things. Uh, PhD last year uh, came up with a formula that uh, he thought it was own. Actually, it's over 2,000 years old, and he said that uh, people are, are the best pill that you can take. And as, as profound as that sounds is God has said that from day one, that we're in the business from Genesis forward, that we're in the business to connect with people. Last time I checked, there, there's 7.7 .7 billion people in this world. Uh, this is not the place for you to be a hermit. You know, we were talking about that in Sunday school today. And God fully expects you to connect. I've worked with people that have walked up my sidewalk and their chin was scraping on the ground from depression. And after just spending time just talking, nothing I did, no hocus pocus, no special formula, but just a matter of uh, 60 minutes of just talking and being a good listener. Uh, I'm not saying they were skipping uh, down the sidewalk back to their vehicle, but they felt a lot better. 
you know, one of the greatest things we can do for people is rub shoulders with people. Okay? I had a question during break, you know, how do you, how do you pick confidants in your life? People that are going to put uh, uh, positive uh, deposits in your life. Now, sometimes God will raise up people and put them in your path. And you know, when you think about people that have caused you to walk in a good direction or a better direction, that was all God ordained for that. You know, sometimes the confidants, like I have two confidants that I've never met, but I follow their teaching. You know, Ravi Zachariah, who is a world-renowned apologetic professor, I follow him all the time. John MacArthur, another tremendous teacher in God's Word. So we got to pick people that are going to make deposits. And, and my, my comment uh, was that, you know, try to pick a person that's already there where you want to be because they've paid their dues. You know, they didn't take the elevator, they took the stairs. And they will speak very plainly uh, in regard to what it's going to take to get there. Uh, I just uh, had contact with a clinical psychiatrist from uh, Fort Trump. She's retired now. She did her clinical uh, when I was doing my clinical in the early 70s. Her husband and herself just retired. And uh, God's sovereignty, I was pumping gas. And I look over and I hear this lady say, hey, Bashiani, and I look over and it's her. I haven't seen her in 40 years. Can you imagine? I mean, what's the chances of that? So, so what I want to say is that God raises up people and puts them specifically in your life to help you get to a place where you need to be. All right, let's go through this list pretty quick. All right, so one of the other things that tends to be somewhat detrimental in regard to positive changes, we tend to take, uh, try to eat the whole elephant rather than just part of the elephant at a time. Um, the forward, I'll say it this way. It's not going to sound very clinical, but it's the truth. The, the best sustainable steps that you can take to get from point A to point B are small, ready? Probably putting in those small incremental steps or habits. Now, if you're like me, I am very, I, I think Linda would tell you, I am very disciplined in regard to my study habits. I take that mason jar every day and I turn it upside down or the other way over. I'm very disciplined in that. But there are other parts of my life that are not so disciplined. Now, the problem is, if you take parts of your life that are not so disciplined, they, time, they tend to kind of leak into the parts of your life that are disciplined. And that causes you to kind of say, well, wait a minute, you know, I'm so much further than I was maybe even a year ago. Just take a week off and stop studying. So that's, that's my biggest enemy. I hear this little voice sometimes that says, you know, take a breath, man. What is wrong with you? You study three hours a day for seven years and you take a break. But I got this other voice that says, don't let up. You know, God's got great stuff for you. So my battle... I just was sharing this. My battle is to, and I know this sounds crazy, but it makes sense in my world, and maybe, just maybe in your world, but my battle is to turn my back on the good in my life, hear me out, and reach for the great. Now, I'm not, I don't say that so I get accolades or pats on the back, but, you know, there's a lot of stuff in your life and my life that's not sin per se, but it doesn't cause a lot of fruit to grow. So if you read that whole thing about pruning in the Bible, there needs to be some pruning on. And, and in my case, there's a lot of pruning that needs to go on. So I want to prune some of the good stuff that's not sin, but it doesn't bear a lot of fruit. And I want to get to the stuff that's going to cause me to do great things for God. All right? So maybe, just maybe, you can kind of relate to that. So take small incremental steps. And, and the reason why I say that is that those steps are, are so much more sustainable, small steps, walking in the right direction. Uh, all right, like I said earlier, having goals without an action plan. If goals don't have an action plan, they're just dreams. Now, God wants to hear your dreams and aspirations. God is a tremendous listener. But we got to put action plans on them. You know, what time of day are you going to get up? What are you going to study under? I said a few minutes ago that all the things you need to know are in a book. The average American in 2018 less, read less than one book in a year. Leona, my favorite librarian, is here tonight. Hi, Leona. 
she's the real deal. She's Miss Reader. And she would tell you the advantages of reading a book. So we got to get to a place where we just inhale books. Think about it for a minute. If you spend some time at the feet of a scholarly person, uh, you will grow immeasurably. Okay? If you get someone that's done, done something for 40 years, you will grow immeasurably. My dad, one of my dad's best friends was an FBI agent. I remember as a little boy, I came up to his waist and he traveled the world, but when he would come home, his son was in high school with me, and I would listen for hours the stories that he would tell. Now, he wouldn't tell us all this stuff, but he had a lot of cool stuff to share, and I learned a lot. I learned a lot about people and you know, who were good people and who were safe people and how did you know the difference. And, and that stuck, with, you know, I'm 68 years old and that still stuck with me. Okay. Uh, we talked about failure. I said failure needs to be what? Fail quick and what? Get back on the saddle. All right, remember, failure is part of positive growth. Uh, not committed. That's, you know, people never reach their goals because they're not really committed or motivated. You see that shirt right there? It says what? Decision is a what? Well, growth is a what? I'm reading it upside down, right? Growth, <laughs> growth is a decision. So, so we need to be motivated to do that. And motivation, you know, once you get started motivated to a place you want to be, all of a sudden it starts picking up momentum. Wrong environment. I was counseling uh, a gentleman years ago. His father was a pastor. I take a deep breath, probably seven years ago. And he, great guy, had a beautiful family, had four kids. Uh, he would go to work in Syracuse at a factory. At break time, he would go out in the park a lot, get high. His family's falling apart, he's gonna lose his job. I'll change his name to protect the innocents. I said, Jimmy, what are you doing? He said, I can't, I, can't, I can't get away from him. I said, all right, let's, let's talk about some of the triggers. And he was well-versed. I spent hours with him teaching him the, the trigger cycle. I said, what are some triggers? Well, he said, the guy you get high with. I said, so what's got to happen? He says, well, I need to not associate with him. Bingo, right? You need to take his ability to call your phone, take it out. How about environment? All right, don't go in the parking lot for lunch. Eat in the break room. Right? I don't care where you eat, don't go out there anymore. Let's look at all the different triggers that cause you to do things you shouldn't do. Let's get rid of them. That's how you get rid of bad habits. You get rid of the triggers. And you replace the bad triggers with what? Good trigger. So when you feel, hear the sense of devil kind of knocking on your door, you know, and be vigilant and say, man, hit the road. You gotta guard the door. You gotta guard what stuff you allow in your life. That's a big hope to say that you got no control over that. I will tell you today and tomorrow you have anywhere from 50 to 60,000 six, 50 to 60,000 thoughts that will come into your brain. And you know what? 95% of them are the same thoughts that you had the day before. And if they're bad thoughts, you're going to get in that habit loop and it's what? Going to keep repeating and repeating and repeating. And then emotions drive the bus. So you think, you feel, and then you act. So we got to we got to, the enemy is how we think. We got to change how we, uh, how we're uh, brought into certain, uh, uh, certain things in our life that are going to cause us to do things that we shouldn't do. Triggers, all right? So it's not, it's not brain science. Well, it is brain scientist stuff, but you know, you got to take a very candid look at that stuff. Okay. Wrong environment, no positive people in place. Like I said, you know, there's some people maybe, just maybe, in your sphere of influence that you should, probably shouldn't be around. So love them out of what? At a distance. There's no shame in that. Okay, the two most powerful words that will affect your growth. Ready for this? Probably should jot this down. We've got about another 15 minutes. I'm going to talk quick because I want to get across some of this stuff. Two powerful words in your vocabulary is the word ready. Yes and no. Let me give you a little wisdom, not for me, but every time you say yes, very often there is a far greater responsibility than you think in regard to your answer of yes. 
when someone says, well, you know, can you volunteer? It's only going to be like one meeting a week. And, well, we got to roll up our sleeves and really do a little digging in regard to what it's going to involve. Because all of us are just so maxed out with our schedules, don't you think? Okay, so yes is a powerful word, especially if it's going to cause good in someone's life. The other powerful word that I'm getting better at, that I have been real good at, is the word no. <laughs> My wife's listening to this. The more you say no, uh, the more uh, opportunity is going to open up your life for things that are going to go from good to great. Okay, I get encumbered, that's the word, I get encumbered by not saying no enough because like you, I mean well, you know, I got the Lord in my heart and I do want to help people and do this and do that. But if we don't say no occasionally, what happens is we get stuck in the good mode. And I don't want to be in the good mode, I want to be in the great mode. Not Once again, not for the pat on the back, but I want to do some unbelievable stuff for God. And for me to do that, I got to bear uh, unbelievable fruit, right? So in order for me to do that, there needs, needs to be some time set aside to do that. You need to be intentional about some things. Oh, this is one of my favorites. All right, so we're all, in, once again, here's that word encumbered again. We're all encumbered with too many stuff to do. I, some years ago, if you ever visit me, I got a tremendous library, which I don't use so much anymore because I'm getting stuck in this tech old stuff. But uh, I, some years ago, I bought a complete collection of famous speeches from presidents. And uh, one of the speeches was... Uh, one of the books actually was from Eisenhower. You know, just a really bright guy, was a general. Where's the colonel? You listening, colonel? So Eisenhower just, because uh, he was president and he was a general, he just had a real busy schedule every day. So what he did was, um, this is called, uh, it's called the Eisenhower Matrix, but it's also called Priority Decision Matrix. And you can do this at home. You just get a sheet of paper, draw a line down the center, and the left side, that's all the things that come up in your horizon each day that you consider to be urgent. Okay? And in that urgent spot, there are going to be some things during the day that you, gotta, you can't do anything else. You've got to stop and drop everything and what? Do it. If I got a phone call, for example, my wife is stuck on 81, can I say I'll be there next week at 4 o'clock? No, that's not going to work. So <laughs> that's going to be in my urgent column, all right? Now, uh, now there are, below that, there may be some things that are urgent that I can delegate, right? JB and I, we're friends, so we're buds. So sometimes JB, will, JB today said, Bosh, can you do me a favor? I got a lot on my plate. He said, can you uh, uh, do a little uh, vignette there at men's breakfast next week for like 20 minutes? I said, absolutely. So. JB was encumbered, uh, once again, with some to-do list that was urgent and had to be done, but he delegated it out. Make sense? So there are some things in life that you need to just simply delegate out. Excuse me. Now, the other side of the column is stuff that's not urgent, which is most of the stuff, by the way, that comes in your horizon each day. And uh, what Eisenhower did was, uh, for the non-urgent stuff, he decided and scheduled a time within, like, three or four days to kind of deal with it, all right? He didn't forget it, but he scheduled the time to do it. And then there was some other stuff that not only wasn't urgent, but it wasn't important. So what did he do? He deleted it, all right? Now, that sounds terribly simplistic, but that basic four-box process he used through all of his presidency, uh, graduate of West Point, I, uh, yeah, I'm real familiar with that, and he use this uh, system from when he was in West Point, really neat. So maybe that's one thing you can do to help unclutter your life. Okay, so God never created us to have an emotional limp. Two of the worst phrases that we uh, can utter in our lifetime is, I'll try and I'll start tomorrow. Wrong. Those are crutches. I was going to get a wooden crutch if I had the time and saw it with a saw to be more dramatic, but I said I better not be a fool. So, As believers, there are two things that drive our thinking in the right direction. The power of God and the power of prayer. And I said earlier that sometimes we don't see a lot of fruit because we don't spend a lot of time praying. You receive not because you 
ask not. So we drop the ball on that asking part, don't we? I do at times. But they, both those things got to work together. Some years ago, I bought my first team of draft horses. Uh, I bought them as Colts out in Chipshawan, Indiana. Trucked them home, and I raised them, broke them. And then I went to Quebec and took a course on logging uh, logs out of the forest with horses. And I spent two weeks with a Mennonite farmer up there. And there was, I think there were six of us in the class. And uh, I still remember the old Mennonite farmer, nice man, very tall, like 6'3", very soft-spoken. And, you know, he did his teaching from a blackboard in, in, uh, in the barn. But the, t the things that I gleaned the most for was during lunch because we would ask him questions. And I, I, I remember I asked him, I said, you know, what's, what was your biggest challenge when you first started out with your teams when you brought them to the woods when they were young? And he chuckled. He said, the, he said, he said the biggest challenge was that I really had to depend on both of them to get the log out of the woods. I mean, we were skidding uh, uh, cedar logs, probably 30 inches in diameter, probably 14 foot long, tremendous tonnage. And I, me and my partner had a big team of uh, Pertrons. They stood about uh, 20 hands. They weighed probably 22, 2400 pounds. And man, the minute uh, that those horses heard that click, when we hooked to the evener with the, with the tugs, man, they just took off and you better be ready. All right, you better be ready. And the point I'm getting with all this is that we gotta rely on both the word of God and our prayer time with God to get to a place where we need to be. That, that, that's how things get done. That's why the word of God has so much utility. All right, these are my top four scriptures in regard to uh, spiritual growth. First one, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Second one, I am a new creature in Christ. Pastor Glenn was talking about that today. Third one, I can do all things. There's that superlative all, all things in Christ Jesus. And the one that really uh, sends a message to me, I thought about my ways and what? Turned my feet. So the expectation is that God fully expects us to think. Here's a famous quote. What you practice in your private study time will be rewarded in public. You know, for a couple of years there in the midst of my seven-year study, I'm still studying, but I just kept shaking my head because I didn't have a lot of opportunity. You know, I'm not a pastor. Uh, I'm a retired teacher. So I didn't have a lot of venue. But, you know, God, you know, one day, one morning in my devotion, said, Bashiani, you dummy. Just keep studying. I will uh, produce the public time when it's ready, when you're ready. All right? So I knew in my heart that I, even though I didn't have a list of to-do uh, things and seminars coming up, that God would bless me with that when, it, when I was ready. All right? It wasn't when I thought I was ready. It was one when God thought I was ready. So that all that behind-the-scenes stuff is just so important to get us ready to do the work that God calls us to. All right, I said earlier that our personality uh, is comprised of three things, how we think, how we feel, and how we act. And try to find a marker. Okay, so let's go a little further. What do I mean by that? Okay, last month I talked about uh, of all the places you can park on any given day, the healthiest place for you to be, to park, is the present. So, you wake up in the morning. That's one of the real common questions I very often uh, ask people on counseling. I said, how did you feel this morning when you got up? All right? If people are depressed, they'll, they'll drag the depression into that first footstep out of bed. They've been thinking about stuff at night, and they keep rerunning that. Uh, emotion over and over again. So, so how you feel in the morning is very telling in regard to where you're at up here. All right. So, so our healthiest place is to be in the present, not one foot in the past and one foot in the present, but both feet in the present, keeping one eye on the future. Once again, it's not who I am now; it's who I'm going to be. 
right? Over a lifetime, we become what we think, what we feel, and how we act. And understand there is a strong relationship between our free will, our choice, and what we think about is the key positive change. So, so how we think is how we change behavior. Every behavior, probably should jot this down, every behavior is driven by a belief. The reason why people don't read books is because they don't see any value in it. They don't believe it's going to be of value to them. Okay, so change your belief system changes the way you act. When you get saved, when you go from believing in God to really believing in God, that whole belief system starts to tweak how you think, how you feel, and how you act. Every choice we make is a direction towards the destination. Direction determines destination. And that works in the business field, it works in the field of spirituality. Whether you're a carpenter, a pastor, a parent, a grandparent, you know, it's all about the direction that you take. I said earlier, I think I did, many of the challenges we often face each day are not conquered by a single answer, but by a sustained habit or routine that you put in place. See, as humans, very often we, I don't think I did mention, I think in Sunday school I did, but um, very often we're looking for a single answer to a problem. In reality, it's not a single answer at all. It's a routine or habit that we can put in place to keep us perpetually moving in the right direction, okay? So don't always look for a one answer to a solution. You know, don't look to have your situations changed. Look for skills that'll help you deal with those situations. Almost done. Positive change begins when we make up our mind to be defined of what we can become. I'm gonna go through these quick. You already gotta write quick. We've got four minutes here. Everything you need to know is in a book. I mentioned that earlier, some of the points. Here's the deal. It's not I'll believe it when I see it. We gotta to get to a place where we say it's I believe it and then I'll see it. That's faith. Faith is what? Believing in those things what? Yet not seen. So believe it before you see it. You came to church this morning, you prayed to God you couldn't see. You couldn't touch and you couldn't hear. All for the reason is that you had faith that God is listening to every single word that you have. My favorite quote of all time by Gretzky, famous hockey player. Don't skate to where the puck is, skate to where it's going to be. You know, put some goals in your life where you want to be. It's not okay to be just constant and just stay where you are. You know, enlarge your walk. Get to a place where you want to be. Practice makes permanent. You don't need less problems. You need more skills. Realize failure is part of success. Fail quick. You'll never forget that, see? Okay. Oh, this is a cool one. Roger Bannister. He's the one that broke the four-minute mile. They said it couldn't be done. They said if anyone rode or rode, if anyone uh, ran, a mile quicker than four minutes, their heart would explode in their chest. There was a famous phys physician that said that, Banner Bannister said that's hogwash. So what he did was he visualized a time clock that it was less than four minutes. And in 1952, thank you, he broke the four minute mile. Never been done before because he visualized what the clock would read. Thomas Edison, a thousand failures for the light bulb. The two most powerful words in the English language are, I am, fill in the blank. I am a pastor, uh, I'm a counselor, I'm a mechanic, you know, aspire to what you want to be. Lisa Nichols, thank you for the quote, Lisa. There isn't an elevator success, you gotta take the stairs. Successful people have a larger not-to-do list than a to-do list. Great athletes, musicians, artists never miss two training days in a row, okay? 
You're either a thermostat or a thermometer. A thermometer reflects the surroundings. You want to be a thermostat. You want to set the goal. All right? You want to be a thermostat. Your life needs to be a thermostat. Set the goal that you need. <clears throat> Stand guard by the thoughts, people, and situations you allow in your life. The Bible has said that from day one. Whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Psychology 101. Four things, four goals. I'm going to leave you with this one. i got a ton more, but because we're out of time. Just four things I want you to look for each day. All right, number one, be thankful. The Bible says, come to God with a thankful heart. If you were under the teachings of a rabbi, back in the Old Testament times, a rabbi would take a little boy's hand, and he would count the fingers, and the largest finger is the thumb. And the first prayer that they were taught that uttered out of their mouth was to have a thankful heart to God. All right? Number one. Because when we're thankful, all of a sudden it starts to wick away some of the negative stuff that's going on in here. So come to God with a thankful heart. Psychology 101. Number two, be hopeful. A lot of people in this world tomorrow are going to get out of bed. They don't have any hope. You have hope because you have Christ in your heart. You can do things that no one else can do. So if you don't know the Lord, grab me by the collar after this and say, how do I do that? Because you get this whole benefit plan when you accept Christ in your heart. Third one, be inspired. Have some people in your life that are going to inspire you to get to a place where you need to be. And you may not even have met them. Like in my case, you know, I got Ravi and, and uh, MacArthur. You know, get some, some folks that are going to inspire you. And finally, be a student. We've got to be taught. Spend some time at the foot of people that you're going to glean some things that they've learned over the last 30 or 40 years. I take a deep breath. I got like eight hours more of this stuff, but that's all I'm going to share with you. It's like five after seven. Uh, I just want to thank you all for showing up tonight. I hope you've got some stuff that you can use.